Hello and welcome. Nice to see everybody. Um, give me one second while I uh, we get while we spotlight the speakers. Awesome. Hello again, everybody. I'm Divya Kakkad. I'm the head of platform at Graham and Walker. Um, we'd love to know where you are dialing in from. So use the chat, tell us where you are um, and we can get started. Uh, we really wanna make sure there's an interactive session. If you have questions while we are you know, having this conversation, make sure you pop them into the chat and we will queue them up and try and weave them in as we go along. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Graham and Walker is a venture firm on a mission to reshape the NASDAQ by supporting and investing in tomorrow's most powerful companies. Before I in, uh, introduce our distinguished panel of founders, I want to acknowledge that today's topic is a hard one, but like so many other moments um, in this journey, in this founder journey, it's an important one. And our hope is that today's conversation is um, one that can that that all of you can learn from, um, you know, because the panelists have a rich, you know, have their own rich journeys where they've seen the ups and downs. And, um, you know, we, we, we want you to be able to walk away from, uh, from this conversation uh, and use uh, what you've learned to inform where you are. All right, without much further ado, I'm gonna start by introducing uh, our first panelist, Avni Patel-Thompson, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Milo. She is a third time founder building technology solutions that make everyday parenting lighter and more connected. Previously, she was the founder of YC Back Poppy. That's how I know you, Avni. I used to be a user of Poppy. Uh, and prior to taking the entrepreneurial plunge, she spent over a decade building consumer businesses at PNG, Adidas, and Starbucks. Our second panelist is Diane Lansinger. Uh, who has founded three companies. Her third company went through a Techstars accelerator where she raised over 4 million in VC funding. She also has a diverse set of non-founder leadership experiences, including global recruiting, businesses at Microsoft, replacing a retiring founder or CEO at a VC-backed startup, which I would want to hear so much about, um, and serving as uh, an entrepreneur in residence at Pioneer Square Labs. Diane, Diane is now a solo founder incubating a new startup idea currently in stealth mode. And last but not the least, welcome our third panelist, Megan McNally. Uh, Megan is a business lawyer, stra uh, strategy consultant, serial entrepreneur, and angel investor. In 2017, Megan founded Diana Sports TV, a streaming network dedicated to women's sports that, in her own words, failed resoundingly. Today, she runs the f -bomb Breakfast Club, a thriving peer support community of 5,000 plus women founders and the Foundry Law Group. I know you're also an angel investor and have, have um, are just a, 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 a very known leader in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm very excited for today's conversation. As you all registered for today's forum, you submitted questions for our panel, which um, our team has used to inform and uh, the prepared questions that we will discuss for the next 30 minutes or so. And from then we will open it up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, I, I know that, well, for today's conversation, it's really intended for founders only. While we cannot control who attends uh, because most of our, our events are open for everyone, we, we're trying to create a safe space for you all to have and ask uh, any questions any um, today. So there is no judgment here. Um, our own teammates sitting on the investing side of the business are sitting this one out. And we will be recording this conversation, like I said before. So if you have, if you prefer to be off camera or if you want to ask your question um, and do not want it attributed to you, just feel free to DM it directly to me or Jenna and we'll make sure we just weave it into the conversation. Sounds good. If everyone can hear me, hi. Sounds good. Hands up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, great. Awesome. Let's start. Um, Diane, I want to start with you. So you were mid-pivot um, of an apparel company. I believe this was your first startup uh, when you identified another opportunity that became Siva, which is your second startup. Um, can you talk us through what was going on at the time um, with that apparel company? What were the signs that you were seeing that was making you think that it is time to unwind. And then sort of following up with that, you had the second idea, 
how, you know, I know as, as serial entrepreneurs, this happens a lot. How do you make that decision to say, okay, no, I think that this is the time to end this for whatever reason. And then, you know, I'm going to sort of transition or take cool off and then start on, on this next idea. So talk us through a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So the first company that you mentioned, it was called Kinwolf. It was a maternity uh, bump to breastfeeding back to work and beyond apparel company. It was a hard goods company, which has its own unique challenges. Um, so I was actually manufacturing. I was doing the designing. I had no fashion background. So I was in a you know, vertical ramp up mode for that. I'd been working on that for about two years and had gotten my product picked up at Nordstrom and was working on a collaboration with P in the Pod, which is one of the divisions of destination maternity. So things were looking pretty good, you know, early stage, not making a lot of money, but had learned a lot and the brand was starting to gain some traction. But the, the act of making physical goods and selling them in a traditional retail mode is the worst business model, in my opinion. And this is in the early 20 teens. So I had already been thinking about pivoting that company, as you mentioned. Um, this was when uh, Rent the Runway had been around for about five years, but wasn't doing any real apparel. They were mostly just doing events. They were doing no maternity. Latote was out there uh, not doing maternity yet. And so I was thinking, oh, maybe I should pivot this to a rental model. So I, so I think of this as sort of my first potential you know, venture-backed startup. I was already starting to investigate and research that business model, talk to some early stage VCs in the region and get some feedback on the idea. Um, and, and I think that that, I'll just say that I think that that is really important for pivots in general. If you're looking at something and it's just not feeling right, it's worth the time to think through what an optional business model would be. Uh, and then the second company that sort of landed in my lap, sort of, um, <clears throat> I suppose I built it in my lap at the same time. Um, my co-founder actually approached me. My co-founder randomly was my dad. Um, was not my co-founder at the time. He had retired. He had developed some uh, intellectual property and a, 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 a product around that that he had gotten some very early market placement in. And he's not a business guy. And he had asked me to just help him out since my background is more in business operations and growth and um, you know getting something to market. Um, and I just decided that I would help him out and take a couple of meetings with lawyers and some consultants that he had. And I realized the team around him was just awful. And I also realized that the IP that he was sitting on was something that was the, the beginning of a much larger opportunity in a much more interesting space than what I was working on. And so that was kind of my aha moment was I took about a week and spent uh, several days going to meetings with him and investigating this other idea. Um, I did my own analysis of total addressable market and some thoughts around what, you know, what the long tail of this could be. And I realized that the impact of that business would be much bigger than what I was currently working on. Um, and so I said, hey, I'm going to give this six months. I'll keep working on the other idea, but I will commit to six months with you to kind of on a part-time basis, figure out if we can get some traction on this. And that's what I did. I spent six months with him. I said, you know, we will, if it goes well, we'll co-found a company. I'll be the CEO. I'll be the one in charge, which he wanted. He doesn't like being in charge. I'll be the primary shareholder, which he wanted. So I was kind of asserting my position that I wanted to take in terms of a leader in the company. Um, and I said, if the, at the end of three to six months, it feels like we have something viable, then, then we'll go ahead and apply for our Techstars program. So, so that's actually what we did. Ended up being successful, ended up getting success, uh, at, in terms of early stage. Um, and ended up getting accepted into a Techstars Accelerator program focused on transportation and mobility in the Detroit area. And that to me was like the final, you know, it landed in my lap, but then I had to do the work to really decide, is this worth shutting down this other venture? I ended up shutting down the engagement with P in the pod. I ended up pulling the product out of Nordstrom. I ended up sunsetting that entire brand and said, you know, full force, if I'm going to do something, I have to focus on that other thing 100%. And I myself did the pivot instead of the first company. Love it. I'm picking up. So yeah, you're listening to Signal, you're receptive to other ideas, and you're creating a timeline. You're yes. sort of giving yourself that, you know, having the discipline of saying, okay, I'm going to give this this much time um, to, and then building out this other idea that you have. 
Amazing. Yeah, and most of that six months was spent, you know, anyone who's launched a product um, and has said, I'm going to listen to customers, right? I'm going to spend the yeah. first month, two months, three months, double that if necessary, and keep listening to customers and get in front of customers with the idea, with the product, and then also talking with them about the long tail and trying to validate that. And that was really the validation that I was doing was, do the customers want this type of solution? And it, it came back at the time that they were looking for that, so. Same question uh, to you, Avni, with Poppy. You had been through an accelerator and uh, even raised a seed round. So can you walk us through what signs at Poppy made you want to sunset? Yeah, so I think um, in some of these things you can only understand in retrospect. So I feel like the Poppy experience was quite a bit, it was slightly different than what um, what my experience is with a lot of like companies that you end up making in the choice to like either a sunset. So. One thing, uh, I'll dive into the Poppy experience specifically, but one thing kind of from a general standpoint is um, it took me some time. I'm the daughter of uh, small business owners. Um, I, you know, I, my concept of business is a lot of like, you know, what you see, even though I've got an MBA and you started going into like venture backed kind of companies, it's really hard to understand the math of venture backed companies until you're like really in it and you really learn it's zeros or ones. Like everyone says it's zeros or ones, but like, it's really hard to understand what that actually means until you're like actually venture backed and actually pushing for what that means. And so what that means is that you're in the business now of either making something that makes it massively big or not at all. And so that took some time for me to then understand what does that like actually mean? And so um, I say that in the context of a lot of the folks that I've then subsequently seen um, trying to make the choice about like, should I sunset, should I not, or, um, should I shut down? Um, a lot fall into this sort of group of like, you could call zombies, you could call actually have a nice potential to become a cash flow business. Um, but it's a some bucket where you've got some traction, but it's not the thing that's going to be the rocket ship. And that almost like sometimes um, can be really hard to live in that space. And so like, I think there's a whole conversation to be had there, which is like, you're seeing some early glimmers, but it's not really taking off. Does that just mean you have to put your head down and like persist? Or is it just like, that's not a venture backable, fast, high growth thing. So I think there's some a conversation to be had there. Coming back to Poppy specifically, um, some of you, you know, I can recognize as like use the service and all this stuff. And so, um, Poppy in, in a similar, I suppose, way, um, I kind of call it my accidental startup. Like it was totally born of curiosity. I didn't have a background in childcare or anything. I truly was a mom that was just trying to figure out like a thing that could work better for like me and for all of us. And so putting in a, like a little test that was like non-technical at all in Madison Park kind of took a spark and then turned into a thing that I basically from day one had to just hang on to. And I don't think I understood um, that was a gift in and of itself because like you can only experience your experience going forward. And from day one, week one, of course there was effort and it was like hard and like you had to do all the things, but from like the first week people wanted what we were building and putting out there. Um, it was such a big need and the way that, um, I had thought about wanting to solve it just because I wanted to solve it this way for myself, like it resonated. And so, what that meant was like week on week, we just had people signing up, right? And so again, I don't wanna make it sound easy, but it's a very different problem than most, the vast majority of other like kind of uh, ventures face. And so our job then ended up being like, do right by that. And then the next step, the next step, right? So that meant eventually finding a technical co-founder that meant finding the money to be able to fund this. So we got funded by YC and then did raise the seed round. Um, for Poppy, like it was very, again, I, I don't want to say it was clear, like what it felt like I wanted to build. So let me say it this way. What I wanted to build and what I still want to build is this notion of a modern village for parents. Um, a way to use technology to make the concept of village accessible to families again. And so I say that in that way, because I think like we as humans know a lot of the things that we want to do. And I think just given the constructs of modern life, I think like it's just not the same as like you're not growing up in the same places as your um, parents and all this other time stuff. But when you start to then enter the space of like venture backed, well, then what's your business model and how are the returns going to happen and how are you going to scale this? 
And so I say all this because what is like your very nice kind of mission and the thing you set off to do sort of starts to like morph and like have to become something in and of itself. And so that said, like for a good three years, we were building every single month, we were growing like every single month in our investor update, we had posted growth. Um, whether that growth was 5% or 20%, like there was growth there. And so again, it was really hard to understand. Like, you know, it seemed like everyone loved what we were doing, needed what we were doing. Um, for me, the decision started to come on the scalability of this because again, I signed up for a certain game and it's not even this game. Like my point for all of this is I've always wanted to build accessible stuff that's accessible to the millions. Um, not just the one percent. Like I think we could have still had Poppy running today if uh, I had made the choice to turn it into a cash flow or like a higher membership or something like that thing. But for me, that was neither what our investors signed up to do, not what I set out to do. Um, and so again, I'll I can go into the details of any of this, but the ultimate decision to shut down uh, what was a operating company, making revenue, employing lots of people. And I would say lots made served thousands of people every week. Um, it was a reflection of the lack of scalability of it in the future and not necessarily things that necessarily weren't working in and of itself. So it's a little bit different, but still this, complicated. Yeah, this is so interesting. And I, I definitely want to like talk a little bit more about this because we see this all the time, right? We see businesses um, that are tech companies, they start off being tech companies, but then as they um, as they sort of are in that growth mode, you tend to, you know, there's a, there's a moment of like, okay, well, this is a revenue generating company. It just doesn't make sense as a VC backable company. And that conversation is a hard one to have with founders or even for founders to understand or like even accept because sometimes they just don't want to accept that. You don't want to accept that. Or, you know, if you can, you may have a perfectly great company to run that, you know, you don't have to be answerable to investors um, uh, with. And that's a perfectly fine path to go down. But like being, having the maturity or having the wisdom to be able to make that choice uh, or make that decision, I think is, um, uh, a, a hard one and uh, not always very um, clear. Uh, uh, I, I want to hear more about your perspective, Megan. Um, can you tell us a little more about Diana Sports um, and what what happened there? I uh, yeah, I think that was it was it's a it's a different model, and I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear um, what been what been done there. Yeah, uh, I'll apologize in advance to the F-bombers on the call. I see a number of folks from our F-bomb breakfast club community who, of course, have heard this story a thousand times. <laughs> so I'll try to share it in a, a different light. But first, I just want to, um, you know, um, reflect back, Avni, what you're saying about, um, and and Divya, what you're just saying about when you talk to founders and you're trying to tell them it's their business is not venture backable. Um, that that can be hard to hear. And I think that's because we, in a startup culture in particular, like we place a premium on landing venture funding is somehow seen as the success when it's really a means to an end. And so I think it can really feel like a value judgment if you're told something it is not scalable. Mm. Um, but our, yeah, our story is a, a bit different than both of the years, but there's a lot of parallels too. So um, Diana Sports TV started as an idea for an app. I was scaling a corporate law firm um, and I'm a fan of bike racing and I was frustrated by how hard it was to follow women's professional cycling um, uh, from the US in particular. And so I just had this idea that I would create an app that would make it easy for me to follow the women's tour. That was it. And I started talking to people and what I kept hearing was, oh, well, you know what I love and can't follow is surfing. Do you know how hard it is to find and follow the, you know, the pro surfing tour? Or fuck, I love skateboarding. Do you know how hard that is? And I ended up um, with an idea of a larger sports media network. So it was the kind of thing that started small and then it grew into a really big idea. And the point at which it grew into that big idea, that's when I merged my law firm into Foundry Law Group and decided I needed to focus really full-time on building this startup. We made it so far as um, we had the product built, we had licensed an entire library of amazing sports documentaries, 
We are in the process of negotiating licensing deals with several uh, semi-pro leagues and a number of NCAA conferences. Um, and we had one original reality show that had made it through production into post-production. So we put a lot of money into it. We had a lot built. Um, and I had a handful of early investors, but they were angel investors at this point. So they were not yet institutional investors. And it was time to start signing some really big deals, like seven figure deals. And all of a sudden the fundraising stopped. The investors that I had talked to out of the gate who were so excited for this were not writing checks. And when those checks stopped coming, I started panicking. And part of what was happening for us is that I had two different audiences of investors I was trying to listen to. On one hand, I had media investors telling us that what we were building was not big enough. We were gonna to have to take a much bigger swing right out of the gate to be taken seriously and to get the deals that we needed to have the kind of content we would need. And on the other hand, I had tech investors saying, scale it way back, <laughs> you know, dial everything back, raise a much smaller amount, build a small thing, put the MVP out there, build up from there. And those are two very different approaches. And I tried to split the difference, which was the fatal mistake, honestly. I mean, there were lots of mistakes that I made, but that was the big one, was trying to split the difference and go up the middle. And so what happened is nobody had confidence. The media investors did not like the scale back plan and the tech investors did not uh, you know, like the what felt to them like a ratcheted up plan. So none of them were willing, willing to write those checks. And I was supposed to sign contracts now on these really big deals without knowing where the money was going to come from. And it would be a long time, of course, before there would be revenue. Um, and I had a series, of, I left town for a series of pitches to investors that were really like, you know, I had said clearly, all right, in, in the next 30 days, I have to raise X amount of money. I have to get, you know, this number of commitments or the risk is just too big. So I had a very specific timeline, a uh, number you know, of yeses that I needed. I hit the road and it makes me cringe today to think about how those meetings went because I was terrified because I knew it was all about to crumble. Like going into those meetings with that kind of pressure on your shoulders, I just cracked. I literally cracked um, and, you know, and it was a disaster, unmitigated disaster from these investors who were like, this does not seem like the same person we spoke to six months ago. You know, I was like this completely different person in a state of desperation. And I got back to Seattle and I knew I needed to get out of my head and get some objective advice. So I went to two powerhouse women investors here in Seattle, um, Sarah and Serena. And I, you know, I said, I, I need to, I, like, can I just pitch to you? They were not potential investors in what I was building, but I was like, can I just pitch to you and you help me see like, what are the flags? What, like, why is this suddenly going so far south? And so I went to their office and I'm halfway through this meeting with them when I burst into tears, had an utter breakdown, just started sobbing because I realized what I needed to do, which was blow it all up and start over, right? That like, I that trying to trying to build it for the investors was the wrong way to go. I had gotten away from building it for sports fans like me. Um, and so blowing it up was hard. I had employees. Um, I had full-time employees. I had contractors who were counting on us because you know they were midway through projects. I had early angel investors who'd written some, the biggest checks they'd written um, as angels. I had just signed a lease on a new office and studio. Like deciding to shut down was horrible, but it was the right thing. And I knew that if I delayed it, I was going to hurt people more than I was about to hurt them by shutting it down at that time. So I left that meeting. I drove straight to the house of my first investor and told her first. Um, so I talked to the investors first um, and then um, went to the office and laid off staff in person. Um, and then I spent the next day having the worst business day of my 52 years on this planet. I called every person that we had fought our way into a deal with to negotiate our way back out of those deals. Um, and it was, you know, it was horrible, but the right thing to do. Um, and so after that, what my plan was, you know, a really big pivot, which was let go of the, of the near-term promise of a streaming network, scale back, build up audience first, like, you know, build up enough audience that when we launch a thing, there are people there ready to subscribe on day one. And I launched a newsletter 
that had some success, like it was building a, a good list, <laughs> you know, it was red. Um, it was, I think it was, I think it was good. Um, but I could not map out a path to serious revenue. There was some revenue, you know, there were like some advertisers who were interested and kind of a subscription model. But like what you were talking about, Avni, like it would have been a thing, it would have been a business, but there's no chance it was going to reach the kind of scale it needed to get the kind of capital it would need to really, you know, ultimately del deliver on the promise. And so at the end of the day, for me, it was a financial decision. I had sold some assets to pay back investors. And that it's a conversation for another day about when, when to pay back investors, you know, um, but I made the decision to pay back my early investors. So I sold some personal assets to do that. And as the company just tanked, my CPA, who's great CPA, ran the numbers and said, if we shut it down before the end of the year, you will be able to take a loss on the business that will offset the gains on the assets that you sold. And the relief of just stemming the financial bleed was like, that's what just made this, the decision for me then and there. And so that's how I made the decision to shut it down. That is so helpful. I, I mean, I think the tactical pieces, uh, we'll get to that because I think that's also a bit of a black box for folks who might want to do it. Like you don't know until you are in it. And so we, I, I want to talk a little bit about that. But um, Dan, I want to come back uh, and say, okay, so now let's talk about, we're considering options. We are we are in it. Um, we are, I'm a founder um, whose business isn't growing the way I want it to. I'm seeing signs uh, from my audiences or my customers or my investors, and I'm wondering what to do. What would you tell them uh, in sort of like a framework? perspective right so I've shut down four companies now so, <laughs> so I guess there's some personal brand I'm growing around this I don't know <laughs> and they've been different flavors some of them have been venture back some of them have been more lifestyle consulting that type of thing um there are a lot of tactical things that I would get into and I'll actually let other people speak to those because the first thing that I would tell people is when you make a decision to sunset anything in your life a business a friendship a marriage, whatever, right? That's not serving you and it's not letting you grow. Mm -hmm. That decision is one of the best, most positive decisions you can possibly make because it opens up space for the next thing. And so you have to think, you have to let yourself, you have to allow yourself to think through, if this weren't here, what would I have the space to go do? And so that might be the first thing that I would suggest to people is go make a list of that, right? And focus on career, but also add personal things. You know, what would, what would this free you up? What would this free your energy, your creative energy and your energy for commitment and excellence up to go do? So and then there are tactical things too, but to me, that's the first thing to address. I love that. I love that so much because I think, um, yeah, just sort of getting out of the space and being able to think forward and having a forward thinking, positive, you know, visualization can make this journey as as hard but you know at least it gives you something to sort of focus on and I, and I like I like that framing very much and it's a muscle if I might add so for a good leader I think you have to realize that there's like there are a set of core muscle groups that you have to you have to form and one of them is the ability to say no and that yes. includes the ability to say no to really really big things and sometimes that's the business itself right so so knowing that a decision that you need to make um, is the, the right decision because what you're actually doing is committing to building your core muscle group as a leader. You know, that to me has helped me say, you know, why is it so scary for me? Why? It's probably because it's weak. It's a weak muscle for me. So I need to lean into that and, you know, and go through the experience of learning how to make that a stronger, you know, tool in, in my toolbox of leadership skills that I have. I love that. I think it's also true when, I mean, I've learned this, you know, with the privilege of being, working closely with really great leaders, Leslie being one of them. Um, and to to recognize, when you recognize that something is not working, or even when you recognize that someone has to be let go, or, you know, what it can be, there's many, many times when you have this really like, this feeling of, oh, this is not working, and I'm just somehow not, yeah, I'm pulling through, and the, the, the pain is real in the daily, but I'm just not able to muster up the courage to like rip the bandaid off that's when you stop and you say okay if this is painful 
there's a reason it's painful and why am I not able to like get over that and also when you recognize when there is that that pain um you recognize that you should actually move fast um cut your losses rip the band-aid move forward and the moment you do that there's relief and that when the feeling of relief happens you know that this is okay that was a good that was the right decision um so I, 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 yeah, some, somebody once told me early on in my career that uh, this is like actually back when I was at Microsoft, um, that I need to be Machiavellian for about decisions. And the first person you have to be, you know, that like, I'm going to make the decision quickly. I'm going to cut off the arm if it has gangrene, right? You have to be willing to do that to yourself. Yes. First, right. And then you end up finding ways to do that involving other people that makes sense, right? That makes sense to the business or to the other people. It might be painful, but it's the right decision. And yeah, so be Machiavellian. Uh, Avni, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the deciding whether or not you were gonna pivot versus the yeah, sun setting. So I think, can we, I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, how would you, when someone is, you know, in that space of saying, okay, well, I'm not ready to give up fully. Maybe there is, you know, I have investors to answer to. So maybe there's something there that I um, should think more about. Maybe there's a pivot. How, how do you know that it's a pivot versus a sunset? How do you think about that? Well, so the way that I've, um, so I think, first of all, you don't, right? Like, so I've, uh, I've talked about this a lot about like, I think about my startups as almost like these series of ex experiments, right? Like I come in and I, like I have an undergrad in chemistry. So I think about this as like just giant um, science experiments, which is just like your job is to run as many experiments as you can until the money runs out, right? And like to extend that time as long as possible. Um, and so for Poppy, I think one thing, I think, most founders have like a North Star, like a, a reason that we're obsessed about this thing and a dog on a bone and on the hard days and nights and all that kind of stuff that gets us out of bed to actually keep on doing this extremely hard thing. And so I think for me, I've always tried to keep that in mind. And if the product had to evolve, as long as I was serving my users in the end thing, then anything was up for like uh, was game. And mm -hmm. so that for me, I feel like we were constantly in a state of pivot, right? I mean, there was parts that worked and then there were parts that didn't and we had to reevaluate. Now, I think the, the way that most people think about pivot is like this core thing isn't working. I am going to completely turn into something else that maybe you can have a glimmer of the piece that you've built and then turn it into something else. So I think for me, like in the last like six months, when it became like really clear that we either had to like change a lot of the economics very drastically, um, we were in other words, like doing nothing but exploring pivotable um, propositions. But you as a founder also have to understand like how far is a pivot too far? And what I mean by that is there's a lot of consumer um, founders that have gone on to then serve B2B or enterprise kind of things, have gone from like this kind of software to something completely different. I can't answer that question for you, but you have to answer it for yourself, which is like, why are you doing this, right? If I were perhaps, and I'm, I'm like totally hypothesizing, if I was perhaps like 24 and the reason I was doing this was that it was me and two buddies and like, I loved working with them and it didn't matter what we were building as long as we were building together, right? And we had started this first thing and it wasn't working. So I was totally cool with them to go then jump into something completely different. Now you still have issues with your investors, potentially your team about like whether like what you raise the money for then kind of can carry over. But I see that as a totally people do that. And I see that as a totally like feasible pivot, if you will. Um, other folks like are like, you know what, as long as I'm serving childcare, as long as I'm in the marketplace of childcare, solving some piece of that ecosystem, I'm cool. So even though I was serving end consumers and now I'm selling it to employers, I'm still fine with that. And I can like manage the whole team and that is worthwhile. All I know is for me personally, I was trying to solve a very specific kind of thing, which is like the safety net that families I think need that can be made up with other humans around us. And it was a very consumer proposition. It was a very, um, like, I would say occasional or ad hoc or whatever you want to call it. It's like the safety net stuff, not mm -hmm. like full-time care. 
And I knew that if I couldn't be doing, if I couldn't get that to work through all the ways that we had kind of experimented, then, and this sounds almost so selfish, but I think one other lesson I've learned from being a founder is there is nothing, your startup is an extension of you. And so you have to both like, understand, be one with your ego in both the good and the bad ways, because there is no action without you fully feeling it. And trying to fool yourself is the first foolish thing to do. So I knew I didn't want to build something for employers or pivot to something else. Um, and so ultimately, that's the truest thing I can say is that I made the call to kill this company. Um, because what I set out to do, I couldn't see how to do it with this money and this kind of path. So for me, the pivotal thing was like, we did look at every other option. And then when that wasn't possible, we also looked at acquisitions. And then when that didn't seem like there was a high probability, then I totally agree that the best kindest thing you can do is to make a call, make it fast, and then execute on it fast. Um, the limbo is where the pain happens disproportionately. Like there will be pain, by the way, maybe like that's like another topic that we talk about at the end. Because I do want to bring up, um, this is not just about like, we can certainly talk about the checklist and the punch list and everything. This is significant, like psycho, like emotional damage to us as humans that put ourselves out there every day to try to do something good and noble and all these types of things. It takes a toll and we have to kind of contend with that as well. Um, and so I want that to also be a matter of conversation because if we don't do that, then we just wreck people and they never get back on the horse again to go build the next thing, which could be the thing because they've learned so much. I love that. I, I want to talk a little bit about that. I know Megan, you, uh, you talk a lot about this in your leadership conversations. You talk about failure as a leader. You talk about, um, some of these pieces that Avni just touched on. Um, I want to first talk a little bit about the different options and then let's talk about the emotional piece which i'm sure all three of you will have something to share about um so the different options you touched a little bit about getting trying to get acquired uh we've heard of the term aqua hired um or even like having you know like having a partnership with someone else which may or may not it, it's a good story like to be able you may, may or may not get money out of it but at least it can it's a sort of you know positive story to uh, be able to sell your your customers or uh, you know to an, to another company, Megan, can you talk to a little bit talk to us a little bit about these different define these different exits and um, how a founder can think about them? Yeah, you bet. Um, and with these, I'm speaking more from the perspective as the lawyer who's helped founders make these decisions um, a lot in the past couple of years. Sadly, during the during the pandemic, a lot of, a lot of folks made some big decisions. But I think the very the first thing is to decide what problem you're solving, right? Because sometimes people are like, I'm just burnt out. I can't, this isn't this isn't what I wanted to build. I don't have the energy for it. I want out. Um, and that's a different problem to solve than customers just aren't buying it or we aren't getting the kind of traction that we need. So the first thing is really to get clear on what is the problem. Um, because you'll have different solutions based on that, right? So if you have a business that already has recurring revenue, you have customers who are counting on you and they're there um, and there are assets in that company of value to customers, it's just not the company you want to be building anymore, right? Then you can look for options that are about your exit. And that might be when you look at the company being acquired by somebody else or you know, we've had some joyful stories at our law firm the past couple of years where actually the employees took over the company. Like the founder, it wasn't the thing they wanted to do anymore and they wanted out. And they found an out that freed up their time to go do, to go build the next thing they're really excited about. And the employees really loved it and they were happy running it at the scale that it was, right? So it's going to depend. So you can look at it being acquired by another company in the industry. You can look at people on the team who are more interested, more prepared, more experienced to run the thing that it turned into um, and look at you know, an opportunity for them to take it over. Um, and then at the end of the day, oh, and, and just to define aqua hire for people, aqua hire is when another company acquires your company and they hire you. So you still get to run it, but you're running it within the walls of a, of a, of a larger company. Um, but you know, there's, you know, shutting it down is not always the only decision, but it matters. 
Um, if you don't yet have, like I hear from folks all the time who don't yet have employees, there's nobody on payroll yet. They've had some customers, but they don't have recurring customers yet, right? They have not yet taken any outside capital. When you're in that space, that can actually be a blessing because you can pause it. You can put it on ice, go do something else and come back with fresh eyes later. Um, but once you have all of those things in place, employees, you know, that, that's when it's harder, when there's actual investors, employees and others, um, you know, customers who are counting on you day over day. But if it is time to shut it down, if you reach that stage where passing on the company to somebody else, letting somebody else run the company or, you know, changing what it is and running that different thing, when those are not options, what you have to prepare yourself is, you know, the conversation that we're about to have, which is the mental toll that it takes um, and that's when finding a really great attorney and CPA, they're not the same and you need both <laughs> when you're planning the shutdown, but a great CPA and a great attorney. Um, and what I mean by that are, you know, the professionals who are empathetic will listen to you, have been through this before, and will help you manage both the cost and the emotional toll of that punch list that Avni mentioned that you'll have to go through because it will it will be drudgery at times and it will be really emotionally draining and painful at times and, and you need a team to to walk you through it i think this is yeah a great time because i'm also looking at the time we have 15 minutes 16 minutes ish left and i have a ton of questions that are being that are coming to me directly um all of them are around this question of okay yes the tactical piece of what should i be thinking about when i've made the decision and I think bubbling right on top of that is, I think we've all acknowledged that it is the stress and thinking about it as a leader. So let's talk about that emotional, psychological piece and how one must, how how you, all three of you um, would advise getting ahead of. So let's start with you, Megan, and then I'll go Diane and Avni. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say is in my experience, um, founders, um, you know, what we're building is personal. You're like most of the time there there is something deeply personal about it. Um, and when something is deeply personal, it can be hard sometimes just to make you know sound business decisions because our emotions are caught up in it. But there's this additional layer if you're a woman building a scalable company in male-dominated spaces, so few of us succeed that we sometimes unfairly take on this mantle that like if we fail, somehow we are letting down the sisterhood. Like we're letting all women down. We're proving all the naysayers wrong if we aren't successful. And we might know rationally that that's bullshit, but it doesn't stop us from feeling it and from sometimes that really clouding sound um, business judgment. So the only advice that I can really give folks is like, just prepare for it. Just know that it's gonna be painful and it's gonna be draining and lean on your support system. But the other thing is to like, actually get out of your gut and into your spreadsheet. <laughs> like, meaning you can't, they can't be emotional decisions at the end of the day. These are very large business decisions and you need to have the business tools and objective metrics to look at, to know what signs are the right signs to tell you it's time to shut down and then trust those and lean into those when you have to make those hard decisions. Diane. And so, you know, from my experience with the four shutdowns I've gone through, you're, it's, it's like going through a death, right? So what's, what was helpful for me in each one of those, and I think I cycled through each one of them a little bit differently, was actually reading about the stages of grief, of which there are five, and if I get them all right, it is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then the last one is acceptance. So, and what's strange about grief is it's cyclical and you can feel any one of those five stages at any given minute. <laughs> so, so the first thing I think is to know that there's a process, so you're, you're on a path and you have to go walk it. And that's actually the way through it is literally to go through it. And then to, to teach yourself the tools about how to identify it. You know, like, why am I feeling so bad about this? Why do I feel like now I'm an utter failure? You know, write it down, write it down. Are you feeling angry? Who are you feeling angry at? You know, yourself, other people, people who made this decision, customers, life, I don't know. Um, are you feeling depressed? Write about that, right? Um, and then, and then you'll find that acceptance becomes more and more common in the things that you're feeling. 
Um, but I think, you know, for me, knowing that there's like a method to it and a process and it doesn't happen, it's not like, oh, this is a punch list. I can go through the five stages of grief. Boom, 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 boom. Right. You it's it's really going to be time and you're going to have to allow yourself to, to grieve. Right. I still think about some of the shutdowns that I've done, you know, could be months or years you know, later, and I still occasionally feel angry about it or depressed about it, right? Um, but then I also feel at the end, like, okay, it happened. And, you know, here I am, I'm on to new things and, and it made space for something else. So, so educate yourself and then find your support people, could be your best friend, could be your partner, could be, you know, other founders, extremely helpful to have other founders around you, might be your lawyer, your CPA, um, uh, might be professional help, uh, but definitely find a couple of different uh, flavors of support around you as you're walking that path. Of me, anything yeah. to add? Yeah, so I think um, the analogy to grief really resonates with me, um, having kind of lived that through. And I think one of the most painful parts um, for, and you don't want to liken it to grieving for another person, but like the grief is grief, I think in a lot of ways. And, um, for a founder, it can feel like a very human presence, right. In your life, like day in and day out, it's like something that is with you like constantly. And I think the hardest part for me having built Poppy, like I still grieve it. I still, it is painful for me. Like it, even when people bring it up in a really positive light of like, wasn't it amazing? It still sh like is shoots like a thing of pain because I think about like the what ifs. Um, but I actually think the more painful thing, and this happens also when we're grieving the humans in our lives, is if people never felt like it happened, like because Poppy doesn't exist today, it's more painful if people pretend like it never ever happened. And I've heard of this um, experience from friends who have gone through stillbirths and like um, young children or like miscarriages. Um, the talk, like not being able to talk about or create space for the, when she ought to have, but that's, I, I would say like a couple of like on the ground things. Uh, we, yeah, we have so many other things to talk about and we don't have much time left, but I, I wanna talk um, specifically about any advice that you might have when you are planning a wind down um, in a way that you can set up success, set yourself up for success for your next venture. I think um, this, I think a lot, a big part of this, I think is the storytelling and the reframing. And I think it probably comes after you have gone through the grief or in acceptance, uh, but you know, I, I, if someone has to get ahead of this, how would you, how would you position this? Um, let's, let's start, whoever wants to take this question. I'll just quickly say that I actually disagree. It's not after you've processed everything. It's that I think how you actually tackle it and how you rip off that bandaid and how you deal with it in that moment, I think is more telling than the rest of it. Um, and I think it was the most su surprising thing, but when I had to go through Poppy, like we had four stakeholders, we had our investors, we had uh, my team, we had our customers. And then I, I do put myself on that list. Like I had me to have to figure out. Um, and so once I'd made the decision, like the fast like su succession of like informing investors and how we were gonna proceed and then informing users and telling them how we were gonna make it okay. And then figuring out and making it right with my team. Um, that did more for the subsequent conversations and emails and who would want to work for with me for me and invest in me subsequently than anything else. So I, I agree with that so much. And I would say, um, if, if you're thinking about how you're going to set your next venture up for success, how you include investors in those decisions is so important. If your investors find out through chatter in the community that you're shutting down, you're never going to be trusted again, right? Like they're your partners at the table. And so they should be hearing it from you first directly. And ideally, it's not a surprise to them at that point, because if you have been watching the signs all along and keeping yep. your investors really honestly informed about how things are going, they've been seeing those signs too. Um, and so them seeing you go through the process of reading the signs and coming to like a sound um, decision is more important actually than what the decision is in terms of how they're going to trust you um, going forward in the future. 
Diane, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I would add, uh, if just one more thing to that, yep. own the message. It's really your job as the leader, as the founder, as you know, the C-level, whatever your position is. Um, you have to own the message in the same way that you were out pitching to customers, pitching to investors, right? Pitching to strategics and make yourself write out the bullets of the message and make sure that it's authentic. First of all, it represents you and the wins that you had, and then also the reasons behind why you ended up deciding that this has to be a sunset decision. But you have to put yourself through the process of, of really owning the message and then deploying the message. And I would also say that uh, just like in fundraising, you will learn with each conversation that you have that there's a way to iterate on that message to make it more clear, more succinct, um, and more authentic so that each audience that you have to talk to understands why the decision is happening. Can I just piggyback on that for one second to also say, um, for those of you that are venture backed or have like a runway kind of like um, consideration in this, we talk a lot about cash out date. And I think that's such, unless we're talking about like, I would take your cash out date minus three months, generally speaking, because people don't understand that sh proper shutdowns and on, I have value judgment on very few things, but on this, I do have a point of view on like what's more proper than not. Mm -hmm. Proper shutdowns take at least three months of cash at the very least, like depending on how much your leases cost and all this kind of stuff. We never ran to have like a lot of outstanding debt or like any of those types of things, but you should always have a mental math of like how many, what your debts are. And I think a lot of the lawyers and the CPAs and stuff get the short um, end of the stick because they're like, well, at the end or like, or any number of different things. This is just my uh, thing to say for any founder here, take your cash out date, subtract three months. And that's the date that you like, that's the date that's your end date. And you should be making calls at least six months out. I just want to echo that. And I feel like I can't believe we didn't say it earlier. So it's such an important point to end on. You don't decide to shut down after you run out of money. <laughs> yeah. That decision comes a lot earlier than that. And that's why I say planning is really key. So I just want to just echo, echo, echo. That and because of it, and there's actually... There, there's actually a legal responsibility that you have as the president of the board or whatever board member position that you have. And it's called the zone of insolvency. If you know that your company has entered the zone of insolvency and there is, there's gonna be proof around this where you might still have money in the bank, but the company is definitely insolvent. You actually have a legal obligation and you don't want your investors or you know, lenders or whatever to be able to pierce the corporate veil and go after individual members of the board, including yourself, if you mess that up in any way. So you can be approaching the zone of insolvency and documenting, documenting, documenting every day, every conversation, every decision, and you're still clear on that, but you should, you should you know, reach out to Megan and people like her and make sure that as you're approaching that zone, you're really crystal clear about when you've passed into it. This is, I, I really feel like we need a whole other hour to talk about uh, so many pieces of this. But before you go, I have one last question. Um, you've all been through this and you've had some time, um, you know, since the last time you had to close, and I'm sure the, the insights keep coming, but what would you do differently um, if you had to go through it again? And I'm going to piggyback also on that is, is, does it make sense? Like sometimes PR can be your friend. Like you want to, like you said, you want to own that narrative. You want to be able to shape that story. And sometimes you can do it publicly and, you know, actually run a story about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you did it? How, what would you do differently? And is talking about it to the press, yay, nay? Let's go start with you, uh, Avni. Um, so I, um, we ended up having a GeekWire story written about it just because Poppy was like pretty prominent in Seattle. And so I am grateful that like, I, I wouldn't have otherwise done it though. Like, I, I don't think like I had a responsibility to my users and then like we communicated with them and all that kind of stuff. I didn't see a need to make it a press story. Mm -hmm. um, but if there was gonna be a press story, then I'm grateful that I got to have a conversation and then it was like sort of spoken about in the right, like in the way that I would want it to be, and which is also to the like, control the narrative kind of thing. I will say I wouldn't have done anything differently because I believe with the information that I had, which is always imperfect, I did the things that I would have otherwise done. And I don't like believe in sort of going backwards and saying like, I could have done something. I'm sure I could have, 
but I honestly am proud of my team and proud of like myself to have been able to do the things that were extraordinarily hard. And so I don't, I wouldn't have done um, anything differently. Um, yeah, I think those are the two main questions. Megan, anything to add? I have a laundry list of things I would have done differently. I will say in terms of press, I mean, we were pre-launched, so, we, so we, that wasn't something we had to factor in. I chose to share the story instead with my community. So within the F-bomb, that's, that's where I disclosed what was going on and had an opportunity to talk about it in front of hundreds of women at a time. Um, and that was, that was important. But if I look back on all of those decisions, all of them I see as they were they were lessons for me that shape who I am now and whatever I'm going to build next. But if there's one I, could, I would do over if I got to do over, it was that decision to try to split the difference between these two different like groups of investors, because that's when I broke away from being connected to the customer that I was building for. That's when I stopped building for them and tried building for these two groups, but not you know, but not picking a path. And I honestly believe everything else we could have learned from and grown from, but that was the, the fatal decision. Thank you. What about, what about you, Diane? Um, I think I'm in Avni's camp on this. I don't know if there's anything specific I would have done differently. I don't think I was a perfect CEO and there are definitely different decisions that I could have made at different points, but I feel confident that in the moment I made the best decisions that I could given the information that I had at hand. And learned a lot and, you know, lived to, to thrive later on and go on to, to better things. Um, having shut down four companies uh, with a variety of, you know, different sets of stakeholders, um, one thing that I think it's important for people to realize is the public is usually not one of your stakeholders. So when you're thinking about messaging closure to each one of your stakeholders, whether it's customers or investors or strategic partners or yourself or you know, your, your partner or whatever, um, business partner, personal partner, right? <clears throat> you, you have stakeholders and you really need to focus on them. Um, and then, you know, if, if GeekWire or TechCrunch picks up, okay, so be it, you know, that is what it is. I would also, su I would also suggest that again, work closely with legal counsel. If uh, the last company that I shut down had a lot of, I wasn't the founder, I had uh, taken over from the founder CEO and was brought on board as her successor when she retired. And there were a lot of very sticky legal issues dealing with physical assets in the business um, where a public announcement or even just me actually communicating with those owners was not something that we determined was legally sound because of other obligations that we had with with investors and more specifically with lenders that we had. So, so again, uh, it's hard when you're going through closure to say, oh, I'm going to go pay, you know, 450 to 800 dollars an hour for a lawyer. But you, uh, again, you want to make sure that you're protecting yourself as a board member and that you know piercing the veil of the board. Um, so it's worth it for sure to make sure that you are handling those communications correctly. Thank you so much. All three of you, this has been so, so, so valuable. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody. I know we are over time, so I want to be respectful. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, applications for our next Catalyst program are open. So if this is something that you are, you know, if you're in that space, um, stick around, send us an email, uh, and we can, you know, talk through whether this is the right program for you. Um, and if you're not yet part of our founder community, please consider joining us for all of this wonderful programming and um, to, you know, just, just huge, huge thank you to our panelists and for everybody here today. Gratitude, you. you have a wonderful day ahead. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.